friends? Okay. Nobody brought their lunch. Oh, you already have it. Okay. Well, welcome all of you. It's great to have such a big group here. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Connie Burton, and I'm a member of the local branch Church of Christ Scientist. And on behalf of all of our members, I'd like to welcome you to this brown bag lunch event, which, as Chet just said, nobody's bringing a lunch, but that's okay too. Um, he'll be talking to us about the discovery of Christian science 150 years ago. Oh, but before I get into this part of it and the uh, introduction, I just wanted to say that if you want to pursue further the ideas that, it, that are presented in this talk, there are several ways in which you can do that. Number one, all of our members would love to have you come to our church services. We have a worship service every Sunday morning at 1045 at the church on 57 Putney Road, which is across from the common. And we also meet on Wednesday evenings at 745. So you're welcome to come to either or both of those services. Also, we have a Christian Science Reading Room, which is on Elliott Street in between Boomerang and the hair salon. And there, um, we're open certain hours, Monday through Friday. There's a sampling of some of the things that we have on the two tables that are back there. Um, we have a weekly magazine, a monthly magazine, and a weekly newspaper. Uh, we also have Bibles and uh, lots of Bible commentaries and research things for, for doing Bible study. And we have our textbook, Science and Health, with Keys of the Scriptures, written by Mary Baker Eddy, and a variety of other things there, too. <coughs> An attendant is there who would be very happy to talk with you at any point if you'd like to come visit there. Um, if you're a web kind of person, you can go to christianscience.com to further expand on the ideas here. And also, this evening at 7, Chet will be back with us at our church, which I mentioned is across from the common. So he'll be there at 7, so if you'd like to come and hear it again, you have an opportunity to do that. It'll be different. We'll do it differently tonight. So. <laughs> We'll expand on these ideas. Yeah. Do the Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Chet is here to talk to us about the discovery of Christian science 150 years ago, and also about the woman who made that discovery, Mary Baker Eddy. Mm -hmm. It's very timely that we're doing this in the month of March, because March mm -hmm. is National Women's History Month. And Mrs. Eddy, in her day, became a very well-regarded, well-respected person and further left to the world this wonderful legacy of Christian science. Um, Chad is very particularly well versed in this area. He worked with the, uh, utilizing his background in, as an artist and a media producer, he worked with the Christian Science Church at its headquarters in Boston for many years, uh, developing the exhibits and films for the Mary Baker Eddy Library. He hails from uh, upstate New York, and drove down this morning, said so he had a wonderful drive. Um, and there he carries on a full-time practice of Christian science, helping people find healing through prayer. He's also a teacher of Christian science and comes to us today as a member of the Christian Science Board of Lectureship. And now we'll turn it over to Chuck. I want to take you on the road with me. That was just so beautifully done. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for that warm introduction. Great to be here. What a beautiful place you live in. And the drive up was a piece of cake. I left early this morning, but coming through the mountains, you know, the Finger Lakes in this part of Vermont have a lot in common, a lot of water. Um, one thing that's kind of special about being here in March and where I'm coming from is I live just down the lake from Seneca Falls, New York, and that's where the first women's rights convention took place in 1848. And my introduction to the Finger Lakes was working on an exhibit for the national park there in 1997-98. Uh, in they uh, wanted a perspective on Mary Baker Eddy because they didn't know much about her. In fact, in their library, they had a book uh, that was titled Women in American Religion. And uh, you'd think that she would feature prominently, but she had a short paragraph in that book. <laughs> and they thought, gosh, you know, she's one of the few women who've really launched a whole new faith. And you know, she's written a book that's been a perennial bestseller. It's touched the lives of millions of people around the world. Um, we need to know more about her. So I worked with the Christian Science Church in Boston on a, on a major exhibit for the National Park, and it was so well received that it ended up staying there for a couple of years. And now I'm back in this beautiful area to live with my family, and uh, so it's just nice to um, 
be thinking about that connection here in March, Women's History Month, and as we explore this whole topic of spiritual discovery, I don't think there's a more important subject that we could all be thinking about than spiritual discovery. I mean, we love the age we live in is an age of discovery. Uh, you probably have heard the, the statistic that there have been more scientific discoveries in the last uh, 100 years or so than in all the, recorded, the rest of recorded history combined. So there's been this tremendous acceleration of scientific discovery. Well, Mary Baker Eddy was right at the beginning of a lot of this new exploration in science, and she's saying, why should religion be left behind? Why shouldn't we also be making discoveries about the nature of God, about the nature of healing, about the Bible? Um, she didn't feel that religion should be stereotyped or left to past perceptions or doctrines, but that we could be continually understanding more about what the scriptures taught and what the nature of God is. There's a beautiful image I love from um, her childhood in Bow, New Hampshire. Um, and she recalled this one day on a carriage ride when she was a very accomplished uh, American figure and she'd gone out on a carriage ride near her home in Bow, New Hampshire. And she said, today I saw some little children climbing a hillside near Bow where I grew up and they reminded me so much of my disposition. I always wanted to climb to the top. I always wanted to reach the top of these hills and look out over the other side. It's always been so in spiritual matters with me also. She had a spiritual curiosity. She wanted to know what was on the other side. She wanted to look a little bit further. And I love that about her. Her writings, her ideas have spoken to me because I consider myself a thinker, somebody who's very inquisitive. And my study of Christian science invites that doesn't limit that. It, en it enables me to be a thinker, to explore the Bible, not just for the historic record that is there or to rely on uh, someone else's perception, but to really dig in deeply to the Bible and particularly into the life work of, of Jesus. Mary Baker Eddy said something quite uh, remarkable uh, over a century ago, and these ideas are still radical today. Uh, in her major work, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, and there are copies here when you leave today, she said, Jesus of Nazareth was the most scientific man that ever trod the globe. He plunged beneath the material surface of things and found the spiritual cause. And I don't know how natural that is for you all to think of Jesus as a scientific thinker. Um, some of you are comfortable with that. You know, some of you have, you know Mary Baker Eddy's writings, but these, this was a radical proposition. We think of, think of him as a, well, a kind of miracle worker, somebody who was uh, exercising supernatural powers, if in fact the kinds of healings reported in the New Testament are true. But she saw him as someone who understood God, understood the divine nature, understood God's laws so well that he could put them into practice. And she devoted her life to understanding that underlying science and helping others practice it. And, and today I'd like to give you just a little uh, tour of that discovery, and how she came to it, how she arrived at it, how she put it into practice, and how it's continuing on today. I had to laugh as I was getting ready for this talk, um, a cartoon came to my mind from uh, several years ago. It was Carl Sagan, the, the famous uh, astrophysicist, or astronomer. And he was looking up, it was, um, it was Carl Sagan as a boy. And there was this little boy on top of a hill and he was looking up at this sky full of stars. And the little line underneath the cartoon was, gosh, look at all those stars. There must be hundreds of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, if he'd said hundreds of trillions, he wouldn't be right then. You know, to, the, to our naked eye, we can see thousands, maybe tens of thousands. But we know, uh, as one astrophysicist told me, that if you look just through the Big Dipper in, this, in the night sky, just through the Big Dipper, there are more stars through the Big Dipper than all the grains of sand on all the beaches of the Earth. Just through that tiny window in the sky. Isn't that humbling? Doesn't it make you feel like there's a lot more to discover out there? And science has opened up 
our understanding of the universe in remarkable ways. Well, Mary Baker Reddy a century ago was saying, why is there this divide between religion and science? You know, why can't we begin to see that there, there could be a scientific basis to religion and that science is helped by having a spiritual dimension to it? You know, many scientists today really are in awe of this universe, the order, the precision, the beauty, and they do allow for uh, a divine intelligence, a spiritual uh, intelligence. I don't know if you know the, the writings, the thinking of Alfred North Whitehead, but I love this statement from him. He was a British mathematician and a philosopher, and he said, more than anything else, the future of civilization depends on the way the two most powerful forces of history, science and religion, settle into relationship with each other. Isn't that a powerful statement? Those two great forces, Mary Baker Eddy, uh, a century ago, she spoke of uh, Christianity and science as the two largest words in the vocabulary of human thought. And as I read earlier from her major work, she saw the founder of Christianity as a scientist, a scientific thinker. He had said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So she wasn't comfortable uh, thinking of him as a miracle worker. In fact, in her book, she defines miracle as that which is divinely natural, but must be learned humanly. So what we see or think of as miracles in biblical times were the natural demonstration of divine law, the divine law at work. And she saw Jesus as somebody so familiar with that divine law that he could put these ideas into practice. And she saw his healing work, spiritual healing, as completely natural. But we had to learn it humanly. We had to understand it. And so I'd like to give you a, a brief tour uh, uh, through this discovery process that she underwent as a, as a thinker. You know, she brings together these two great ideas, Christianity and science, and she, she says that there is a, uh, a Christian science that can help us solve human problems and, and, and help, help with our health and healing. But in, in, in a way, when you look at her own life, she came from both a Christian, deeply Christian, and a scientific basis as a thinker. So it's not surprising, the more you learn about her history, that she would bring those two ideas together. As a child growing up in rural New Hampshire, she said her favorite subjects in school were natural history and logic. And she was a voracious reader. She loved, you know, just plumbing the depths of textbooks. And uh, she had a, a teacher who taught her, said that she's, she's genius level. She's just a remarkable thinker. And she was always asking questions, always going deeper. Um, she, she grew up in a very religious uh, family, a congregational church. This was a, um, had developed out of a, the Puritan um, uh, religion in America. And when we think Puritans, we think, religious extremism, right? Actually, the, 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 the best uh, depiction of Puritanism, well, not the best, one of the most beautiful ones I've read, is in a biography uh, about Mary Baker Eddy called Christian Healer. And in that book, uh, the co-author, who's from Burlington, Vermont, really helps us understand that real Puritanism, it was about pragmatism. It was about day to day, moment by moment, a practical uh, application of spiritual ideas in your everyday life. It was about living close to God and putting what you knew into practice. And so she grew up with this tradition of God being very practical and very present. But there was a strain of, of the, the congregational tradition that grew out of Calvinism. And when you hear that word Calvin, you think fire, you know, hellfire and brimstone. You know, uh, Calvinism was that religious teaching that said some people are going to heaven and a lot of people are going to hell. And even as a child, she rebelled against that view, even though it was held by her parents, was held by the church that she attended. She refused to believe that the nature of God, who she felt instinctively was love, would ever allow a single child to perish, yet alone others to, to be eternally damned. So she rebelled against that. In fact, there's a beautiful story uh, as a child she was having a conversation with her mother one day, and she said, Mama, um, you know, what if we tell God we're sorry if we've made a mistake? You know, will he still punish us then? And uh, her mother said, well, Mary, 
I suppose he will. And she shot back, well, he's not as good as my mother then, and he will find me a hard case. I mean, she really rebelled against that thought that, that, that God would hold a view of his own children in such a way that wouldn't allow for forgiveness. And of course, in, the, in the, the heart of the Lord's Prayer, there's that beautiful statement for, of forgiveness that Jesus taught as the, as the Son of God, who was so familiar with that nature of God as love. So she, she really held on to that, that view. And um, it really, that conviction, I think, got her through some very tough times. Uh, you think of Christian science as a, an idyllic kind of philosophy because Christian scientists think of the allness of God, the goodness of God, the love of God. But this actually grew out of a woman, a woman's experience who faced tragedy, who faced uh, chronic ill health from the time she was young, who faced pain, who faced great suffering. And yet she never traced any of that suffering back to God. She refused to believe that suffering ever had anything to do with God. And in her textbook, she ultimately is going to, to point out in beautiful detail that all suffering relates to ignorance of God. That what we suffer from in, in human experience is our ignorance of the divine nature. And so the more we understand about the love of God, that nature of God is love, the nature of God is spirit, the more we're freed from suffering. So growing up, she was a lively thinker. She was a deep, uh, deeply religious young girl. Um, and she was a, an experimenter. Late in her life, she said, this is my lifelong task to experiment. She said that in her 70s. This is my lifelong task to experiment. Now, that wasn't just a statement about just trying anything, but testing ideas and seeing how they measured up to God, how they measured up to the divine nature, trying ideas and putting them into practice. And, you know, like many people who were ill in her time, uh, she really turned to her faith for courage and for support, but she turned to medicine for healing. People don't see that you can actually bring these together in a scientific way, and she didn't either. Uh, as she was growing up and as she was trying to treat a, a very severe condition she had uh, called dyspepsia that for a time allowed her to eat one slice of bread in 24 hours and then not to wet her throat with water for a few hours after that. I mean, almost in a state of starvation to try and cure that, that condition. She suffered from uh, an inflamed spine, from chronic ill health, from, you know, great, great suffering. And... Um, and so she was looking into the healing systems of her day. She was trying conventional medicine for relief. She went to the water cure. There were some wonderful water cures in Vermont and New Hampshire in her day. You know, exploring the power of water to cleanse the system, to bring healing. She, she explored that. Um, Graham diet, Sylvester Graham, the, for, the forefather of Graham crackers today. Um, it was diet theory. You know, many people today exploring diet theory for better health. Um, so she was on this search, and I want to read an excerpt of a letter from her mid-30s that uh, indicates a, a turning point here for her. Um, she says, about 1857, I was confined to the bed with a long and severe illness. All known remedies were sought, but without success. In my extremity... I promised my Heavenly Father that if he would restore me, I would devote my remaining years to helping sick and suffering humanity. The earnest prayer was heard, and upon my recovery, the vow which I had made was not forgotten. Now, what happened? She goes on with some detail here. As I earnestly studied my New Testament, fresh import was found in the life of the Master. I saw that he not only declared that his works of healing, sickness, and sin should be copied by his followers, but that he also expected the same methods to be employed in helping humanity. Again and again, I asked myself, what was the method by which Jesus helped the sick and the sinful? I began to realize that the only means which he employed was of the spirit. And then I asked, can it be that the only true method of healing is the spiritual method always used by Christ Jesus and his first followers? Can it be that that spiritual method 
that Jesus used was the true method. So in the 1850s, in her mid-30s, she's beginning to get on this track of looking for a science underlying Christianity. And she happens upon the practice of homeopathy. I don't know if some of you are familiar with that practice, but that's a, a practice of medicine that's actually growing in popularity today. It, it looks at um, health and healing in a much broader context. It, uh, in, in, in working with patients, it will look at the emotional, the, the mental factors in someone's uh, a situation, and it will prescribe um, less and less um, doses of, of medicine and drugs instead of more and more. It's actually trying to wean people off of, of medicine. And, and in the, the higher uh, attenuations, they call them, the watering down of these, these medicines, um, they find that the, the medicines are actually more powerful. Well, Mary Baker Eddy uh, began to explore, and not just explore and treat herself with homeopathy, but begin to treat others with it. She had a very scientific thought, and she learned the practice of, and she studied Yar's book of homeopathic remedies for many years. And then she was able to heal a woman who was dying of edema. She described her as, as bloated like a barrel. She was uh, puffed up. The doctor had said she, she wouldn't survive the night. Mary Baker Eddy came in, and she began to prescribe homeopathic remedies for this woman. Immediately, there was a change for her, and the swelling began to reduce. And then, from her own practice of homeopathy, she was concerned that she couldn't continue using the same remedy. And the thought occurred to her to give the woman unmedicated pellets. Uh, today, that's known as a placebo. And there's a lot of scientific research today around placebos. In fact, placebos are scaring the pharmaceuticals around the world because they're showing that placebos actually have as much effect as many very popular drugs. So it's the patient's faith in the drug, not the drug itself, that is resulting in improvement. And that's what Mary Baker Reddy found through t treating this woman of edema. In fact, she was entirely cured by taking unmedicated uh, sugar pellets. Okay? This is what helped this woman recover. After that time, it was clear to her that the mental factor was the most important factor in healing, that a patient's belief was the deciding factor in healing. And then she was led to study with and to go for her own treatment to Maine and study with a man named Phineas Quimby. Now, Quimby was of a tradition of mesmeric healing or kind of a hypnosis, um, but he'd kind of evolved in his own um, treatment, and he, he would be similar to what you might call therapeutic touch today a kind of energy healing. And Mary Baker Eddy's study with him, first of all, she was greatly helped by him when she first arrived there. But whenever she was out of his presence, she would relapse. And now she was beginning to discover that while the human mind might be a factor in health and healing, um, the human mind couldn't be relied on for true healing. In fact, she saw through Quimby's work that it was actually disease had a, a, a deeply mental element. And she was beginning to see what people would call today that um, hypnotism or illness was a kind of hypnosis, self-hypnosis. And that one had to be brought out of that self-hypnosis in order to find healing. So she's, as a deeply religious woman, she's not leaving healing with the human mind. Again, to go back to that letter from uh, her mid-30s, she has a feeling that it is the mind of Christ or the spirituality of the man Jesus that actually is the factor, the real factor in healing. <coughs> and then she's able to put these ideas to the test. She's actually forced to. She's now 44 years old, and she has a very serious accident north of Boston in Lynn, Massachusetts. Now, fortunately, historically, we have a lot of evidence around this experience. The local newspaper published a detailed account of it. Um, affidavits were later filed, people who witnessed this, this whole experience. But let me explain to you briefly what happened. She fell on the way back uh, from a temperance meeting on an icy sidewalk, and she knocked herself unconsciousness, and she sustained internal injuries, including a possible spinal dislocation was one of the um, uh, doctor's uh, conclusions. 
Now, she was very, uh, very weak at this time anyway. She was 44 years old. Many women lived into their mid-40s in America at this time. It would have been a time where if you were weak and you'd come down with an accident like this, you might have just said, enough's enough, and just kind of quietly checked out. But when she regained consciousness, she actually rebelled against this thought that she was dying. And that's what her minister told her, Mary, don't you realize that you're dying? Because she asked him to come back and visit her again, visit her again after his sermon. And he said, I'm not sure you're going to be alive when I get back from my sermon. <clears throat> well, she asked everybody to leave the room, and she opened her Bible. Now, there are a couple of accounts that she references in this. But what's, what's most important to remember here is that she's, 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 she's going back to a book that for her had been like a textbook throughout her life. These were not new experiences that she's opening to. And so when she opened in this moment of extremity to an account of Jesus healing um, a man of paralysis, she, she's familiar with this story. And she's been on this line of thought of the mind of Christ being the healer. And as she's reading this account, she says, the change passed over me. The limbs that were cold and, and immovable warmed. The internal agony ceased. And I stood upon my feet well. Now, some that were there really felt that she was on her deathbed. So to be back on her feet and then to walk into the next room, one woman said to her, my thought it was a ghost. How are you restored to us? The woman, this deeply religious household, said, is Christ come again to earth? And her response was, Christ never left. Christ is truth, and truth is always here. I love that statement because as you get into her writings, what she sees is, I like to think of this as, you know, a lot of us love music. You may love Mozart. You may love the beauty of that music from centuries ago. We can play it because we understand the principles of music, all right? You have to understand the principles of harmony. You have to learn how to interpret uh, Mozart's music and apply it and play it, okay? It's not just that the person of Mozart could play that music, but it was that inspiration and understanding he had and our understanding that enables us to play it. That's what she's beginning to see about Jesus' healing work and that understanding of truth is what she calls the Christ, that ever-present, timeless understanding that Jesus brought to the world. And what she glimpses in this moment is a profound sense of her wellness, her wholeness. She glimpses the fact that her being is spiritual and perfect and whole. And it's that sense of wholeness that enables her to rise up. And interestingly, when the doctor comes back, and says two times to her in quick succession, impossible. That's impossible. She actually relapses. And she has to be helped into a chair. And all the symptoms of this accident begin to come back to her. And she reaches for her Bible again and opens to another count of Jesus' healing. And this flood of inspiration and understanding returns to her. He leaves. <laughs> And she begins to explore uh, in depth what it is that has taken place. What I love about her description of this is that she does not, from the very beginning of the experience, describe it as a miracle. She, she says in her autobiography here that my immediate recovery from the effects of an injury caused by an accident, an injury that neither medicine nor surgery could reach, was the falling apple that led me to the discovery how to be well myself and how to make others so. The falling apple. Who saw a fall falling apple one day? Newton. It was Newton, okay. What was at work in the falling apple? Gravity. Gravity. There was an invisible law at work that resulted in the apple falling. It didn't just fall willy-nilly. And here, she's suffering from a fall. She's calling it a falling apple. She, a, a law of God at work that she's now wanting to understand that divine law at work. One of the most uh, breathtaking things I've ever done in my life is look at her earliest notes from this time period in her life. When we were working on the Mary Baker Eddy Library in Boston, I read the over 600 pages of notes 
uh, called the Genesis Notes here because she's going into the book of Genesis trying to understand this principle of healing. Why does she go to Genesis, do you think? Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of where things get going. It's in the beginning. It's, it's an understanding of how God has created the universe. And what's very clear to me in studying her notes on Genesis is that for the first time, she's beginning to see a clear line of delineation between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, and actually the rest of Genesis. You know, if you know the book of Genesis, Genesis 1 is this benevolent creator creating from a sense of light and harmony and goodness. Everything in that creation in Genesis 1 is made in the creator's own, of, of the creator's own nature. And, and men and women, male and female, are created in the image of God. It is a beautiful, pure, perfect depiction of what a loving God would do. And it's, in a, it's a creation of abundance and beauty and harmony. But then you get to Genesis 2, and it's the exact opposite. Now, for centuries, people have seen Genesis 1 and 2 as basically very related. Genesis 1 is the creation of the soul, that which is eternal, and Genesis 2 is the creation of the body. And of course, when God puts a soul into body, we're now going to be material. We're going to just play out this whole view of humanity and sickness and evil and everything else that goes with it. Well, she begins to see that these two creations are not related at all. They are distinctly different, and she was actually um, intuitive at that time to know that historically now people have found that they were written at 400 years apart. They were not related at all. They were written by different scholars at different time periods. But she felt that Genesis 1, as she's now looking at it, actually indicated the spiritual and scientific record of creation that a loving and good God would create all of his own loving and good nature. And what you see in Genesis 2 and 3 and beyond is this creation of chaos, of, of um, turmoil, uh, a woman being taken of the man's rib and then being beholden to him. And then she listens to a talking snake and they both fall into sin and everlasting punishment. I mean, how encouraging is that? <laughs> and yet... Religion was teaching in her time and still today that we are the offspring of that fall, of that departure. But as a deeply religious woman this time, she's saying, no, Genesis 1 is the authentic record of creation. Genesis 2 is a depiction, a depiction of the way the human mind misinterprets God's creation and seems to make everything come from beneath instead of from above, seems to make everything made of matter instead of from spirit. And she begins to challenge this view in her writings. It took a tremendous amount of courage for a 19th century woman to challenge the most deeply held theological beliefs of her time. And it wasn't a pretty picture. <laughs> her challenging these ideas uh, not having the credentials of a minister, not having the credentials of someone who'd been to theological school, but a woman who felt that these ideas could be put into practice. And, you know, this is the one thing that distinguishes Mary Baker Eddy uh, among all of the religious and spiritual and philosophical teachers of her time and our time, is that she actually was able to put her ideas into practice. She didn't theorize about spirituality. She didn't theorize about God. She took what she was learning and she helped others with it. And I want to just give you a few examples of this. This is the emergence of the science of Christianity, the application of these ideas. And as I mentioned, there's a, there's a book on the table there. This is a book called Mary Baker Eddy, Christian Healer. It includes uh, actually a couple of hundred of authenticated, well-researched, corroborated spiritual healings that Mary Baker Eddy was a part of um, before and after her discovery of Christian science. Um, so what I'm reading to you, um, these all have context to them, and they all have uh, people that have witnessed what she's talking about here. Um, as she begins to make these discoveries, she's living in boarding houses. She's pretty impoverished, actually. And um, the first pe people that she heals are in these boarding houses. 
Um, the first one that we know of was a young boy with a seriously infected finger. He said that the finger was so um, uh, inflamed that he would howl and cry like a girl at the pain that he was feeling. And Mary Baker Reddy became aware of this and just asked him if she could quietly treat his finger. Well, he didn't know what treat meant. What are you going to do? She said, I'm going to just pray for you. I'm going to silently treat your finger. And he told her, uh, she told him to wrap the finger and not give it any more attention. Well, later in the day, he realized that there was no pain in that finger. And it was perfectly fine, and he unbandaged it, and there was nothing wrong with that finger. Well, shortly after that, at one of these boarding houses, she meets a man who's on his way to have a finger amputated because his finger was actually so deeply infected. And she asks him, do you mind if I treat your finger? And this guy says to him, according to the historic record, if you'll be quick, I will. <laughs> I got to go have it cut off. Well, after a few minutes, he said, this is extraordinary. I don't feel any pain in my finger. And he got in his carriage and went about his business. Well, people at that time were, were going to call this a miracle. And she said, but it is not a miracle. This is the law of God in action. And this is what she begins to practice. Now, there are many beautiful accounts of healing here. This is uh, one of the most uh, serious killers in the 19th century was tuberculosis. And um, many of the people that she treated uh, were suffering from tuberculosis. This man says, I was suffering from pulmonary difficulties, pains in the chest, a hard and unremitting cough, hectic fever, and all those fearful symptoms that made my case alarming. When I first saw Mrs. Eddy, I was reduced to such a state of debility as to be unable to walk any distance and to sit up but a portion of the day. I had no appetite and seemed surely going down the victim of consumption, which is the, the term for tuberculosis. I had not received her attention but a short time when my bad symptoms disappeared and I regained health. During this time, I rode out in storms to visit her and found that the damp weather had no effect on me. From my personal experience, I'm led to believe that the science by which she not only heals the sick but explains the way to keep well is deserving the earnest attention of the community. Her cures are not the result of medicine, mediumship, or mesmerism, but the application of a principle that she understands. Now, he really caught that view. Many people were uh, early on trying to relate Christian science to positive thinking, mind over matter, um, some form of mesmerism, hypnotism. But Mary Baker Eddy believed that what was actually at work here was the opposite of that. It was the effect of the divine mind waking us up out of the mesmerism and hypnotism of illness. And only through our spirituality, our purity of thought, our love for God, our love for one another, could we bear witness to this kind of healing. In fact, in some of her early notes from this period, um, because she began to take students, in, in one of these classes, the question is asked, how can I do this healing work so that my healing is wonderful and immediate? And her response is, by being like Jesus. By asking yourself, am I honest? Am I just? Am I merciful? Am I pure? Now, I love that because what we're really talking about here in this, this sense of spiritual healing, as Christian science understands it, is Christ healing. And, and that word Christ, if you think of all of the tremendous qualities of character that the man Jesus expressed, the compassion, the love, the purity, the courage, the unselfishness, that's the character or the divine nature of, of the man. Well, she defines that divine nature as the Christ. And that divine nature, she said, is within each of us. That divine influence is in with each of us. And as that asserts itself in our lives, as we strive to be this good and loving and pure and selfless expression of God, that displaces the fear, the anxiety, the selfishness, all of those things which she learns are really making up illness. She sees illness as a, a completely mental state that is derived of the ignorance of God and God's creation. And it's a right understanding of God that restores health and harmony. Well, I could, I could go on with um, many other examples here, 
But the point I'm trying to make is that what she's practicing here is original Christian healing, original Christianity, that now she's looking at the Bible and she's looking at those accounts of healing, and others are too, as not miraculous, but as provable and practical and every bit as achievable today as they were 2,000 years ago. She writes a book at the urging of a physician. She heals a woman who's dying of pneumonia in the presence of her physician. And he says, you have to write that in a book. Tell us what you're doing and give it to the world. And so she writes her book, Science and Health, uh, later called Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, in order to help people understand this spiritually scientific method of healing. Now, I'm, I'm encouraged by the fact that Mary Baker Eddy didn't see herself as a charismatic healer. If she had just felt like she had this great healing ability and, you know, she's going to go out and practice it and make herself rich and famous as a result, she actually, as things were beginning to pick up momentum for her, she withdrew from the public spotlight. She wanted to teach others how to practice this too. That's why she wrote her book. And the last hundred pages of her book, she devotes to her readers. She wants her readers to describe for us what it is that, how it is they're finding healing. Excuse me. Um, now, there are copies of this book, and, and I always encourage new readers, read the last chapter first. If you want to know the effect of this book and the possibilities of this book in your life, read that last chapter first, because you're going to hear people um, describing and I'll just read you a few of the, the headlines of their letters. Um, substance of lungs restored. Fibroid tumor healed in a few days. Spinal trouble and indigestion healed. A case of mental surgery. Cataract quickly cured. Valvular heart disease. Cancer and consumption healed. But what's beautiful in reading these letters is that the people that are finding these experiences so natural in their lives, it's not about the physical cure. In every case, you're going to find people describing what I like to call aha moments, spiritual discoveries about the nature of God and about the nature of themselves as the expression of God. And that those spiritual discoveries that they're making are, to their surprise, resulting in healing. They begin reading Science and Health, you know, not believing that health is possible, physical healing is possible, but they find that the more they understand of God and their relationship to God, their fear is being healed. Their, that aspect of our human natures that we can call self-centered, selfish, greedy, is also you know, changing, transforming. And with that transformation, they're finding health and healing. I could add my own letter to the chapter on fruitage, and I know some of you here today could as well, that when we find ourselves spiritually enlightened, we find ourselves healed. Science and Health is, uh, was written never as a substitution for the Bible. This book grew out of a woman who believed that the Bible was the chart and compass to life, but that we couldn't let the Bible be left in history, or as a book of doctrine, we had to understand it spiritually. And so her book is an investigation and an exploration of the spiritual meaning of scripture, that deep spiritual message that heals. And what, what people found, what I found, is that it's a book that opens up the scriptures, makes them relevant, makes them understandable in a scientific age. I can't leave logic behind. I find, consider myself a pretty logical person. I can't leave reason behind. We live in a scientific age. But I like to, and I've come to believe, that there is a divine uh, basis for all true science. And there's a, um, a way of understanding Christianity that results in healing. Um, I just want to share one experience from my life. It was one of the earliest experiences I had. And the reason I like to share this is because many people have a, a preconception that Christian scientists are those people who don't believe in doctors. Ever heard that? Oh yeah, you people, you're, you're, you're like the Amish who don't drive you know, uh, cars because you want to use the old tools. 
You know, so you're not using modern scientific medicine, you're just content to use blind faith. That's what m many people, that's their perception of Christian science. Actually, 90% of the letters in the back of Science and Health are from people who came from the medical community. And I did too. So I can relate to these experiences. I grew up in a family where my dad's best friend was a doctor. And when things went wrong, you went to see Dr. Weston pretty quickly. And one winter, I came down with a very serious case of strep throat. Off we went to see Dr. Weston. He prescribed penicillin, and he told me to get in my bed and not move for a few weeks. It was a serious case, and I was a basketball player. So he had just, you know, given me my death sentence <laughs> to be off the basketball court for a couple of weeks. Um, and that period of recovery was extremely um, difficult for me. It was painful and it was um, very time consuming in my mind. <laughs> the next winter when the very same condition occurred, um, I, I began to explore Christian science. My mother um, had found Christian science and been introduced to it by a friend. I knew it had something to do with spiritual healing. I thought anything will be better than what I just did. And I, I called a woman who was a Christian science practitioner. Now, there are some wonderful practitioners of Christian science right in this community. Um, it's a very universal practice. People are practicing it all around the world. Uh, anybody can call a Christian science practitioner. And they really, what they focus on is helping you understand how safe and um, loved and cared for you are, how God is seeing you, how God perceives you and your relationship to God. And so when I called this practitioner, she didn't care about my strep throat. Well, I shouldn't say that. She cared deeply. But she didn't focus on the throat. She focused on my understanding of how deeply loved I was and how safe I was. And I'll never forget one particular thing that began to happen as I listened to her explanations of the infinite love of God for me was that something came bubbling to the surface of my thought that I hadn't been aware of, and that was how painful my parents' divorce had been and how really alienated I was feeling in our family and kind of back and forth. And suddenly I was feeling this sense of wholeness and love and wellness, not just for myself but for my family. And this fear and this anxiety and all that went with it, it just began to drain like an ice cube from my thought, and I was healed. It was just as natural as the sun coming up over the horizon. And you don't forget an experience like this because it is a spiritual experience and it was absolutely related to a change in my thought from fear to love. I believe that that sense of love that uh, comes through Mary Baker Eddy's writings and her work is the most important aspect of healing. She calls it the vital part, the heart and soul of Christian science is love. Are we feeling the depth of God's love for us? You know, many people feel, oh yeah, God loves me, but God loves me with all my problems. God loves me with all my difficulties. What about God loves you in all your perfection? God loves you in all your wholeness, that God sees you in a way that young Carl Sagan uh, wasn't seeing the universe, hundreds of stars, that there's an infinitude of love for you, for creation, that we've just barely begun to understand. That's what Mary Baker Eddy is bringing out in her writings. And that healing that I had a strep throat when I was 13 years old, well, that got my wheels turning. I began to read her writings for the first time. I found myself healed very naturally of a chronic back condition that resulted in a pinched nerve chiropractic work that had been done for me for years, suddenly now I'm finding healing of that too as a result of what I'm learning spiritually, beginning to understand myself in a, in a completely new way. Um, I was healed of malaria when I was living and working in Africa. Um, I have found consistent healing throughout my life of a range of things, but at the heart of all healing is just this profound sense of wholeness and wellness and love that comes up like the sun. It's just, it's there. It belongs to everybody. It's universal. It embraces us all. And that ultimately is what Mary Baker Eddy saw for Christian science, that this was not a particular denomination 
but a universal teaching that she hoped that all Christian churches and that people of all faiths would begin to see that this was a scientific discovery, a spiritual discovery that belonged to the world. Anyone could practice, whether they had a faith or no faith, that this was a way of understanding your relationship to God. She even, and I, I think I'll probably finish up right here. Sorry, it's gone by so quickly. But I did want to take a few questions here. Um, she, she ultimately saw the dawning of this science of Christianity in relationship to um, a statement that Jesus had made in the Bible. And I love this statement because um, when you think about the work that he did over the course of three years, he was the ultimate teacher, wasn't he? He took students, he trained them, he taught about what he called the kingdom of heaven. I love seeing that phrase as the laws of God in contemporary terms, the kingdom of heaven 2,000 years ago, but where God's laws govern. Um, he, he, he taught these ideas to people. He put them into practice through healing. But he also knew that the understanding of what he taught would come with spiritual unfoldment. And the way he describes that in the book of John is, he says, I have to go away. And you know what? It's like this guy just can't hang around forever teaching people. He actually encouraged his disciples to know that his going away would bless them. He said, I'm going away, but I'll pray the Father that he will give you another helper, a comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, the spirit of truth will teach you all things and bring everything to your remembrance whatsoever I have taught you. In other words, there had to dawn for humanity a sense of understanding of what this great healer and teacher had brought to the world. That's what Mary Baker Eddy felt was happening with the science of Christianity, was that the understanding of this teacher and healer was coming to fruition. It was dawning for the world. And, and so that, that understanding or that science of Christianity really is here for everyone. Her book, Science and Health, is a universal text. And I hope that you know, for some of you today, if this, these are new ideas, um, this local Christian science community has copies of her book there. It deserves to be on the bookshelf of anybody who's thinking spiritually, who wants to explore healing and health from a different perspective. It may challenge you. You may disagree with a lot of it. But there are ideas in there that will bless you, that will resonate with you, that will begin to broaden your sense of the power of love to help you and heal you. And I've certainly felt that in my life, and, and I know a lot of folks here today have as well. Um, are there any questions that, that you want to ask before we let you get on with your busy days today? Um, yes? Um, reading that quote that's um, above the lectern there in the church. Yeah. Uh, Why don't I give you the mic, too, so... <laughs> Uh, reading that quote that's above the lectern in the church yeah. there about setting the seal on the death list or something. Mm -hmm. Jesus threw these were from the sepulchre. Okay, that's what, yeah, all right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it makes me wonder whether Mary Baker Eddy was enlightened. Did she have a spiritual awakening? Did she have a spiritual awakening? Well, well she had a spiritual awakening. Yeah. But was there... Well, I would say that the, the moment I described in 1866, which actually was 150 years ago last month, that healing experience that she had when she wasn't expected to live, she saw as a, an awakening, a spiritual awakening. Um, you know, it was so much more than a healing of body for her. The woman who went into that experience was impoverished, dependent, chronically ill, and now she has an accident. It wasn't that she was just healed of the accident, but she, I think, found in that experience a sense of life purpose and mission and an awareness of this dimension of healing we've been talking about that had to be shared with the world. So is that what you're getting at with spiritual well, awakening? Or? No. No. Uh, <laughs> what, uh, I think my question has to do that people who, even today, who have these sorts of awakenings mm -hmm. are in one sense unable to put it 
into language. Yeah. It's sort of unlanguageable. Mm -hmm. So one has to make do with the best one has. We've only got this language to communicate with each other, and that language doesn't do it. Yes. Um, and but what we are left with then is only the language, which then can become a bit rigidified. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I think what interests me more than really what you've been talking about is the possibility of this woman who awoke, lacking a better word, to something. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. what she had in her day was the Bible that was the only channel. So she spoke in those words, yeah. and yet that even doesn't yeah. get at it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, she said the most difficult, and she describes it in these words, the most difficult thing for her after this spiritual awakening was putting it into words trying to translate these big metaphysical ideas, mm -hmm. spiritual ideas, into what she well, called... I wouldn't even say ideas, mm -hmm. I would say experience. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it is, uh, um, I think it's a, it's, it's a thoughtful question. You know, I'm not sure I can nail it for you here right now. Um, I do think that one of the, the neat aspects of her work is that she... Um, she sees in scripture a, a spiritual language that's been lost. Uh, and and it, she, she says um, you know, that there's an inspired word that is often hidden behind the, 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 the language, you know, the, sort of the clothing of the words. And it's that spiritual sense of the Bible, that spiritual sense of God that she is constantly trying to, to understand. Um, but a lot of her healing work um, is wordless. It's an interesting thing when you read it. I mean, it's, it's, it's not a lot of arguments. It's not a lot of, uh, you know, wordy prayers. It's a, a, a sense of the allness of God and the exclusiveness of that God. You know, um, a point I wanted to make earlier is that I think what distinguishes her work as a spiritual thinker is that most of us are trying to accommodate evil in our lives every day. We're trying to, trying to make sense of it. We're trying to fit God into this picture, and we are in a dualistic kind of mindset. Mary Baker Eddy felt that we had to get to the place where we're really understanding that there is God and nothing else. There's the allness of good, the allness of love. And, and so I, I see her contributions along the lines of, helping humanity understand that and appreciate that, but then also dealing with the apparent evil, the, you know, the, the illness, the, um, the war, the conflict that we're dealing with, that there's where she begins to give us explanations that are, again, rooted in things Jesus said and did, like they are lies, you know, deceptions, that they're not, um, they're, they, they don't have a divine nature, they haven't come from the divine nature. So she felt that, that Jesus was ultimately giving us that, that sense of the allness, the exclusivity of God's allness. It didn't vie with another power. It didn't battle with another power. And I think a lot of our prayers each day, a lot of the work that we're doing is really our unwillingness to go to that allness, our unwillingness to really accept that there is God and nothing else. And that's what the great spiritual thinkers and prophets and others have been trying to say. And in the Old Testament, the, the refrain of the prophets is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Well, there can only be one infinite. You can't have two infinites. And in that infinitude of good, of God, of love, there is nothing else. And I think that that's, that's what she was trying to describe and, and what enabled her to heal. Anybody else? Would you speak to the um, the rigor of the scientific method mm -hmm. that Christian science teaches and yeah. describe that a bit? The rigor of the scientific method. Well, I, I mentioned earlier that Mary Beck Reddy 
you know, she loved natural history. She loved logic. Um, thanks for coming, everybody. If you got to slip away, that's good. I know you got lunch, and yeah, thank you. Um, like any science, um, there are rules, there are laws, there's tremendous depth to it. Um, there's a simplicity to uh, many of the key ideas in Christian science. The, the sense of the, the allness of God, the love of God, the, um, what she would call perfect God and perfect man, um, the, the sense of um, God, as Jesus said, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. The, the broad ideas are quite simple. The application of those ideas is why she wrote a 700-page book. <laughs> um, you know, somebody once pointed out to me that in, in this book, about 7% of the statements are absolute. In other words, those, those statements like God is all, um, that, that spirit is infinite, that, that can't be qualified by any other statement. They are absolutely true. Only about 7% of the statements in her book are absolute, but 93% are application, the science, the, the deep, detailed understanding of how you put these ideas into practice. Um, I began a, a study just... Um, earlier in the month, and I'll just show you some of my page marks here. Um, this is her chapter called Christian Science Practice, and I've begun to note the rules and directives on each page for applying the science uh, in our lives. And maybe just a few uh, examples here. Um, she says, never tell the sick that they have more courage than strength. Tell them, rather, that their strength is in proportion to their courage. Um, maintain the facts of Christian science, she says, that spirit is God and therefore cannot be sick, that what is termed matter cannot be sick, that all causation is divine mind acting through spiritual law. Um, Explain audibly to your patients as soon as they can bear it the complete control which divine mind holds over the body. I mean, she, she's a practitioner and a healer, uh, someone who puts these ideas into practice on a daily basis. So from her work as a healer, she's now saying, and here's how you apply these ideas with your patients. Um, it's, it really is, even if you've studied this book for years and years, I feel like I barely scratched the surface. Like I'm, I'm really barely being rigorous enough with my own practice and, and taking these ideas uh, seriously. So I don't know if that helps a little bit. Yeah. It's probably time for you to get back to work and on your way. Um, tonight when we, when we get back together, for anybody that wants to return, you know, I think what we'll do is explore um, healing in a little bit more depth. Um, I've given you a good overview of the history and the discovery, but maybe tonight we can explore a little bit more about um, healing and, and some of the issues that we may be facing today when we're trying to put healing into practice for ourselves. So um, thank you very much for coming today. And, <laughs> and thank this, uh, I just want to thank the, the community that uh, brought us together, the Christian Science community. It's, you know, it's, it really is. Christian Science is a universal open door for anybody exploring spirituality and healing and how these ideas can be applied. Um, there are some wonderful books back there. There's the Christian Science Monitor, a very insightful Pulitzer Prize winning newspaper that Mary Baker already founded late in her life, um, a monthly magazine with examples of healing in it. Um, so some of that stuff is free. Some of that stuff maybe they've got uh, available for selling from the reading room. but. Um, anyway, you're always welcome to stop in and, and explore this stuff. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.